For more than 300 years, Ragley Hall has been the ancestral seat of the Marquesses of Hartford. So, are we in Hertfordshire? Don't be silly. Next news, you'll be expecting Leeds Castle to be in Yorkshire, or for the Duke of Devonshire to live in Devon. No. Ragley Hall is in Worcestershire, Shakespeare country, 450 acres of exquisitely landscaped gardens and just over there some well-kept lawns that would be the perfect place on a day like this to park a lot of old classic cars. <laughs> So Matthew, Ragley Hall, a new venue for your shows. Yeah, very excited. Long standing event. Uh, I think it's been running over 25 years. Huge event in the Midlands. Great reputation and yeah, first event for us this time. A um, bit impacted by the weather, but huge potential and really keen to get back on track and make it a regular year yearly event. And a, a fantastic selection of vehicles as ever, I think. The thing I like most about your shows is just the sheer variety of, of vehicles that turn up, anything and everything. And often cars and motorbikes for me as well, like the Cotton Motorcycle. I, it's years since I've seen one of those, and you never know what you're going to see when you turn up to one of your shows. Yeah, 100%, and I think that's kind of the ethos of it, really. You know, everyone's welcome, bring whatever you've got. If it's a modern classic, if it's a vintage, if it's something a bit crazy um, or unique, bring it. And I think today, there's a lot of cars I haven't seen before at, at our events, some really rare and a lot of old, really old cars, some really interesting stuff, some good bikes, and um, yeah, the more the merrier. So will this become a, a regular stop-off uh, for you, Ragley Hall? That's the plan. We've got really exciting plans for it going forward and the plan is to get it back to what it used to be, you know, where you were getting 800 cars plus a day and it was just a really, really good day out, wide range of entertainment at a stunning grounds and, and garden. So maybe a two-day show next year? Maybe. Um, I think we'll look at a different date next year. It was a bit of a rush this year to try and drop something in this year that worked for everybody. So we'll look at a different date, possibly talking of Father's Day for next year, try and stick with that date going forward. But uh, yeah, this is, this is something we're very excited about and we think we can really build on. What a car. Thank you. Um, this car nearly cost my sanity uh, with the rest <laughs> restoration. Um, when we got it, it was black and white and we wanted to return it to the factory colours. So I replied to Rolls-Royce because uh, the Rolls-Royce Enthusiast Club, because Rolls-Royce keep the records for every single car they build. And when it came back, it came back as these colours. Um, and we made the decision to return it, like I said. But as soon as the paint came off, the whole thing fell apart. Bits of paper with plastic padding coming out of holes, holes starting out at two millimetres ending up like this. Um, these swave lines, they weren't even here, they were all plastic padding all the way across and um, it was just one thing after another and after another. Was that the lowest point or were there even lower points? There were lower points. <laughs> <laughs> this is a cloud one but that's not what Rolls-Royce called it. That's right because there was no other cloud at the time so this was the first silver cloud so they only called it that as soon as they brought out a two everyone basically called it a one and as soon as they brought out the three one two three this one has what would we call it is it it's, um, velveteen perhaps you could well call it that i don't know i know it grips your trousers when you get in there so <laughs> it's beautiful i'm looking at it and it looks it looks so much better than the leather well another thing about these cars is that sometimes or most of the time the front was leather because the aristocracy don't sit on leather. Leather's hot in the summer and sticky, and it's cold in the winter. So a lot of the time, the driver was left with the uncomfortable leather, plus the fact the driver most of the time maintained the car. So if he got oil on his hands or something and got on the leather, he'd just wipe it off. And that you often see them with leather at the front and material at the back, because leather is only really a modern type idea of luxury. It wasn't back then. Yeah. So a lot of the time you'll see them changed, but I quite like it as it is, because it looks very plush. 
Was this the sort of car that would have a partition betwixt driver and passengers? Some did, yeah. Some These came out of the factory. This is a factory car. But they came out with chassis and engines, and you could have them sent to places like Park Ward, and they would build the car you want around it. So some would have partitions and that. Um, there's a few long wheelbase ones, which are about a foot longer, and they always have the electric partitions, yeah. This is the sort of car that was owned by the great and the good. <laughs> but the owner of this car was so bad yeah. that his name yeah. became part of the English language. Yeah. Peter Rackman, the yeah. horrendous slum landlord, yeah. and his name, Rackman, became Rackmanism. And That's it's right. in the yeah. Oxford English yeah. Dictionary. Yeah. yeah, just about as bad as you can get. And yeah. he was mates with the craze. Yeah, well, we didn't know this when we bought the car. It was only when we got the build sheets, because with the build sheets comes some of the history of the first few owners. And it was a stone quarry person in, in uh, Lancashire originally. And he only had it for a year. And then Rackman picked it up in the second year and had it right through to he died, which I think was about 62, 63. Um, but yeah, when I, I saw P. Rackman the address, I thought, hmm, I'll pump it into the good old interweb and, and up it all comes. And I'm like, oh my, no. <laughs> So Les, you have to have an incredibly wide ranging knowledge of vehicles because otherwise you can't do your job really, can you? Well, one can actually, but um, yeah, and my knowledge perhaps isn't as great as uh, you're kindly saying. But yes, it's all about having a general knowledge um, and looking at the vehicles. But you can get experts and you can get people like yourselves and other people like Guy uh, Loveridge over there. But the person that knows more about that car than anybody is the owner. It seems to me that you have a technique where if you, you're not sure about it, you draw the story out of the owner. Well, well, that's what it's all about. And each story is a story in itself. And a lot of these, you can write books on them. And, and these people who've got these classic vehicles, and uh, I will say, Steve, I mean, the show here today is absolutely fantastic. And when you look out over that park, what you're seeing is a mobile museum mm. of our motoring heritage. Mm. And in particular, the British love of the motor car. And, and that's what we're seeing today. You can see hundreds of these in museums around the UK, but to see them actually moving and being driven and then meeting the owners. And these, motor, these owners have got some wonderful stories about where they found them, how much they've spent on them, what they've done to them. And those cars and vehicles are part of, very much part of their life. And I think that's important that we can try and get that from them. And then they can talk to other people and other people come up. And fortunately, I get some good, nice compliments from people and say, well, that was a lovely story. And I think that's what it's about, getting the people who own these vehicles into the arena and to tell us their story. So, Kelvin, which club are you guys here with? Hello, Steve. Yeah, we're from the local uh, military vehicle club from Evesham. Uh, we've got a, a base at Ashdown Farm, which is a period uh, 1940s World War II camp. Uh, we do quite a lot of filming there. Uh, a lot of the movies are filmed there. And we have 13 Nissan huts, about 14, 18 static vehicles, which uh, are kept at the show site. And it's used for various events, reenactors, classic military vehicles, anything to do with military vehicles, mostly from 1940s to 1960s. So what do you guys get out of coming to an event like this? Because it's kind of, is your interest in cars or in military vehicles? Because they are quite different, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. Um, first of all, they're very uncomfortable. Uh, when it rains, you get very, very wet. But then, of course, on a hot sunny day, take the roof off, take the windscreen down. You've got an open top cabriolet convertible, which can uh, go off road. Uh, you can go anywhere you want to in an army vehicle, basically. So if it's going to be a wet weekend and all the classic cars get stuck, we can always get home. <laughs> yeah, there's always that, isn't yeah, there? Absolutely. But so what would people do if they had an interest and thought, I want to translate that interest into owning a vehicle? How do they make that happen? They would go online, they would look under MVT, Military Vehicle Trust, and they would be able to join the club that way. It's not very expensive, I think it's about £20 a year, uh, and that gives you access to all the events all over the country, all over uh, Europe. 
Uh, obviously the 80th anniversary of D-Day is coming up next year on the 6th of June. So we take over as a club probably five to 700 vehicles. Uh, we go on all the D-Day beaches, Normandy, Aramanches, uh, obviously seen it on television. It's a big national television event. And we take hundreds of vehicles from, well, from England and Europe joins us. And we're there for about a week over the week of D-Day, which is the 6th of June, that era. I've driven a tank, have you? Yeah. <laughs> what did you drive then? What type? I drove a Centurion and I fired it. And I also got a bill because I ran over a tree by mistake and killed it. I'm very sorry. I was only 15 at the time. Oh dear. Well, um, I've driven a, a M10 tank destroyer, which is an American tank, and I've driven over a car. How about that one? That was really <laughs> fun. <laughs> That's the thing when you try and sort of, you know, you always get one up by somebody else. Hey, thank you. Um, I don't think people realise how incredible these cars are. I made a film about the Willis Jeep and its evolution. Uh, I've driven the track one, I've driven the four wheel steer one. Um, I. How about the GPA, the amphibious one? Yes, I've driven one of those. Really yes, I have. Thank you. And you know what? I think this is one of the three greatest cars that was ever made. Yeah, I quite agree. I've had them for many years. Uh, it's a great fun vehicle. You can go out in the rain, in the mud, and on a lovely sunny day, you've got a lovely open top cabriolet. What more could you want? Nineteen thirty-four BSA. This is from the time when BSA had that poster, isn't it? One in four is a BSA with a picture of a motorbike going around the world. And I always thought that meant, oh, one in four of the British bikes. No, one in four of all the bikes made in the world were made in Birmingham by BSA at that time. Absolutely, yes. And uh, yeah, nineteen thirty-four um, Blue Star. So um, quite rare. Um, got some really interesting paperwork there with it as well. So the original purchase receipt for, from Birchington's in West Bromwich. Uh, and I love the way it says they've got on Bull Street they sold radio and gramophones, but the cycles were sold from up the road, 15 and 17 Bull Street. So would this just have been sold in a bike? What was basically a bicycle shop? Because most of the motorcycle manufacturers started making bicycles, didn't they? Absolutely, yeah. And the same with the BSA, and obviously. Um, People will know um, that they also made guns for the war, for the war effort. Um, I think this one may have got squir squirreled away, so um, it didn't go to the war effort in the Second World War, and um, he got tucked away in a shed. And um, and a, a guy named Len uh, owned the bike, and uh, I was lucky enough to meet him and hear lots of stories about this bike, uh, the places it went, the times it broke down, uh, the play, the times he had to leave it in, um, you know, in, in a bush at one at one point when it um, when he got a rear puncture. Hence uh, why you, you always carried an inner tube. So um, you always carry an inner tube now? Uh, it's lens inner tube, yeah. It's so. lens inner <laughs> tube. Oh, it's lens inner yeah. tube. Uh, Chris, I've got a bit of a... It's a Dunlop I, inner tube. Right, yeah. if, if, if you actually have a puncture, I wouldn't really rely on that inner tube to hold any air, mate. No, I'm in the RAC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the other interesting part about it as well, we've got the uh, receipt there. And also the uh, the envelope, which the logbook came in, which is stamped by the BSA. Go on, how much was it when it was brand new? Uh, Forty-five pounds. Bargain. Yeah, so that was yeah. thirty-four. A speed twin in thirty-seven was seventy-three pounds. Right. I'm, I'm a long risking road. a I'm, long road. I'm, ri is. I'm risking looking really <laughs> daft here. It's got two exhausts, but that doesn't mean it's a twin. A lot of people would think, oh, it's got two exhausts. It's not a twin, is it? It's a single, but it's got two exhausts. Absolutely, it's a single um, with uh, twin port and it has high lift cams and uh, high compression piston as well. So um, for its day, it, it was a fast bike. Yeah, definitely. 75 miles an hour. I mean, it doesn't sound that fast, but look at the brakes, or rather, look at the lack, lack of, of brakes. brakes. Yeah, exactly, yes. What about the story with Lang? Because this motorcycle didn't really lead a conventional life, did it? Not really. Um, it was actually bought in um, West Bromwich and it went to Smethwick just down the road. And then um, what happened is um, the guy who brought it originally fell off and his wife uh, stopped him from riding it. So it got put in, into a shed and, um, and tucked away. And um, some, I think it was about 10 to 15 years later, Len spoke to the, uh, the lady uh, of the husband who fell off it and Len brought the bike. And then um, he got put into Len Shed. Um, I met Len quite a while ago. Um, unfortunately, um, 
Len died about 10 years ago and I was lucky enough to buy it. But um, this was in the shed that was leaking really bad and Len wasn't able to um, to repair the shed. How long was it out of action for this bike? We're talking decades, yeah? Yeah, absolutely decades, yeah. So some 30 plus years probably, um, m m maybe even more. But uh, the shed was leaking and we, we repaired the, the roof on the shed to try and uh, keep you know, preserve the bike. And, and you've got a... Uh some of the accoutrements of, of vintage motorcycling. I noticed you've not gone for the jodpers and, and you see a lot of fellas in, in that time and they wore a corset. I, I noticed that you... <laughs> no, no, um, no, I've got a... I'm, funnily enough, I am actually wearing a corset. But... <laughs> One of the boots. <laughs> We're geeking out like crazy with this gentleman because I own uh, the saloon version of his fabulous Citroen CX. Is this the... It's a safari, not the familiar. Not familiar, which is the uh, family version. No, this is a proper full estate car. Most people recognise these as the car. Two things. One, the one that got cut in half in an Inspector Clouseau film. And the other, one, the other thing people sometimes know is that the BBC used them to film horse racing. Oh, is that right? No, yeah, that. yeah, because of the suspension, which of course, yeah. the hydro pneumatic suspension, which of course terrifies most mechanics. You, yeah. you have to know a man, don't you? you knows have to what know he's doing. A man, so you, but you're using it today as, use it as, as a van. A auto jumble. It's my luxury van, and I use it for my retirement auto jumbling hobby. So the auto jumbling business, obviously back in the day, uh, was a big deal. I mean, I'm from Lancashire. You, you, may, you may have noticed, and there was um, a bike auto jumbling Bolton for many, many years that was one of the biggest in the country. But I wonder if since the advent of the internet and eBay and all that carry on, whether this thing is, I'm surprised it's still going because don't most people buy this sort of stuff online? Um. No, I think people still like to come out and talk to others and and meet, and uh, it, it seems to have a momentum of its own. It's not bad to spend a day talking to like-minded people, is exactly. it really? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. of the day and I'd like to take you back in time to 1979 a great year I went to my first gig the jam at Manchester University and it was life-changing and more than anything the 15 year old Steve Berry wanted in this order a girlfriend a Vespa scooter and a Fiat 131 Mia Fiori Sport 115 brake horsepower a five-speed gearbox the owner of this one in fact he owns both of these cars has added some tasteful mini lights and those trick Californian door mirrors. But apart from that, it's completely standard and it looks utterly fabulous in orange. Not as valuable as a Ford Escort RS2000, but I think you'll agree, so much cooler. Right, that's it. Great day out. We will see you at the next one. <laughs>